Okay, welcome everybody. We are here for a really exciting uh, event of uh, the defense by Durendra Nalvo of his dissertation. So I'm Susan Hirsch, faculty member. And I think because we are uh, a chair of Durendra's uh, dissertation committee, I think because we are a small group today, I will ask just to go around and everybody um, tell us who you are and um, um, what your connection is with the man of, uh, of the hour. And we definitely want to welcome Durendra here. We've uh, missed having you uh, around, and it's just great to have you back for this, uh, for this event. So I'm going to pass this microphone, and each person just speak into it. It doesn't amplify your voice, but it um, captures it for the recording that, that we're making. So you'll pass it around, and hopefully it will get back, uh, back to me. Thank you, Susan and Dehendra. Wonderful to see you again. I'm Terrence Lyons. I'm on the faculty here at the School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution. I've had the privilege of having Dehendra on a couple of classes, uh, and I'm also the uh, director of the doctoral program. So great to see you at this moment, Dehendra. Congratulations. Uh, I'm John Dale, and I'm from the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at George Mason University and serving on Dehendra's dissertation committee. I'm Peter Tierney, and I am Dehendra's father-in-law. My name is Jacob Rink. Um, I, uh, Dirinda and I used to be colleagues at the International Crisis Group way back, and uh, we're close friends and old friends. I'm Crystal McDonald. And now it's up to you who you are. Uh, I'm John McDonald, a mentor of Dirinda's, and a longtime member of this organization, and honored to be here tonight or today to, to honor Dirinda. And Direndra was a wonderful worker with us at the Institute for Multi-Track Diplomacy. I'm Kevin Averick. Congratulations, Direndra. I'm the dean of ESCAR. Uh, Sarah Rose Jensen, PhD candidate here at ESCAR and friend. Uh, my name is Hong Zhang. I'm a PhD candidate at the Charles School of Policy of Government at George Mason next door. Um, so also my first time to meet Durandro, but it's, um, thank you for the opportunity. I'm going to do my field work in Myanmar this summer, so that's why. I'm Sarita Limbu, and I'm also uh, a George Mason alumni and working in uh, Georgetown as postdoc, and I'm Durandro's niece. Good morning. My name is Shibat Dahal, I'm his friend. I graduated from here five years ago, so I'm glad to be back here, uh, the same room when I was here five years ago. <laughs> Thanks so much. And l lastly, we have Arthur Romano, faculty member at ESCAR, and welcome, welcome to uh, our group. All right, so, Today, uh, we follow a sort of set schedule that, uh, that we always roll out for dissertation defenses. In just a moment, I'll turn to Durandra and he'll uh, present uh, his uh, dissertation uh, to us for about 40 minutes or so. And then committee members will have an opportunity to ask questions. Heads up, I'll probably be turning to John first as our outside member. Uh, we'll ask some questions. Uh, to probe some areas that we might want to hear more about, and then we'll open it to the audience for questions. At some point, the committee will leave the room to have a short discussion about what the next steps uh, will be. Okay, so Durendra, I want to turn it over uh, to you. Again, we're really happy to have you here and to hear about your dissertation. The title is The Local and Peace Building. A study on community forest management in Myanmar's Kachin state. Please. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm delighted to be here and uh, very excited to share with you about my research and its findings. Um, but before I begin, I wanted to make a few notes. Uh, first, I would like to express my deepest gratitude to the committee, especially the chair. Um, I can't 
say enough words how much I appreciate your generosity, kindness, and critical feedback over the course of both research and writing has been just um, amazing and incredible. So thank you. And indeed, uh, the two incredible professors um, who also provided me with critical and very constructive feedback at, at critical moments. And that really allowed me to uh, be here today. So thank you, Dr. Terence Lyons, and thank, thank you, Dr. John Dale. Um, and I can't start before saying anything to Ambassador McDonald. We thank you, Ambassador. I'm honored that you are here. Um, we go back several years, and we share some deep common interest in our both professional and personal life related to both Nepal and beyond. And I'm, I'm delighted also the dean is here, and Professor um, um, uh, Romano is here, and then all of my friends and my niece. Um, so thank you. Uh, all of um, you being here means a lot to me, so thank you. Um, OK, so as my chair introduced the topic, it's the local and peace building a study on community forest management in Myanmar's Kachin state. So before I begin the proper uh, discussion or presentation about this resource, I wanted to briefly give you an overview of the structure of today's presentation. There are four components. First would be literature review and the central question that this dissertation asks, followed by resource methods and the findings, which I have summarized as the unlikely piece and intransigent piece. And in, indeed, finally, the significance of this research in which I will identify some of the key findings of this research. OK. Um, so what is the literature that I am engaging? My research engages with the peace building literature. So more than th nearly three decades of peace building history suggests that the ideological and theoretical contestations are the key reasons that peace building currently faces um, several challenges. The critics charge that why peace building is in crisis because peace building, which is essentially influenced by international actors, prioritize liberal peace as a main way to enter into peace building arena. That means Liberal peace means a couple of principles, promoting democracy, human rights, rule of law, and free market economy. And the critics, critics charge that in peace building, the international community do carry out liberal peace building without the consensus of local or often known as uh, post-war societies. But the proponents of liberal peace maintain that this is the only one way, this is the only way to go. Liberal peace is the only way to go. This obviously goes back to Francis Fukuyama's end of history and triumph of liberalism. Despite a lot of criticism, I think liberal peace building remains very strong in present time. But then the critics also counter argue saying that there is an alternative. And what is that? That is, they call locally led peace building, or often local turn. And they, in fact, charge that uh, scholars like Paris, Roland Paris, who maintain the liberal peace is the only one way of doing peace building or carrying out peace building, is a kind of deterministic, deterministic paradigm. And so, what, does, what do the critics then propose as an alternative they call a locally peace building is? The, the central part should be the locally led peace building. Yet, there is a debate and consensus uh, among themselves who propose or advocate for locally led peace building that remains opaque, contentious, and often abstract. And so this is where this dissertation comes in to ask a central question. The central question this research therefore asks is, how and in what ways does local make peace building work better or not? 
In order to inquire this central question, this research looks through natural resource management lens. There are two reasons why. First reason is there is an emerging literature that looks at the relationship between natural resource and peace building. This emergence of this particular line of resource and argument is counter to the literature that links natural resource and armed conflict. The natural resource and armed conflict literature argues that natural resource provides economic opportunity, feasibility, that therefore creates condition for a civil war to occur. And this is basically saying that if there is a way that we can comprehensively or strategically use natural resource, then that could probably contribute to peace building. The second reason is to have a natural resource management lens, this research as finds out that it provides an opportunity or lens to look at the politics and process of local. How? Because when we think about natural resources, we often go back to think precious minerals, diamond, oil, jade. We often overlook the importance of basic form parts of natural resources, which are obviously forest, land. Forest meaning I'm not, I'm, I'm not only indicating timber, but I'm also indicating forest resources, firewood, that resources that villagers use to build their homes, animal shelter, and those are their source of livelihood. So li linking from that perspective, it brings a, I, my argument is it allows us to look at meticulous way of politics and process of local. Now, I'm, with this question and lens, I'm, I went to Myanmar. And as you see, Myanmar is in between China and India, in the southeast, Thailand, Laos, and then the northwest, um, India. So it's a very strategically located country. Why? Also, the important part we need to also notice that is it is rich in natural resources, ruled by the military over the last six decades. In 2011, made a transition towards democracy. Um, as you see, this slide is Jade, Myanmar's big state secret. It's by Global Witness, an NGO uh, based in London that carried out a resource on Jade. And it argued that in 2014, in one year, illegal trade was over $31 billion. So you can already see the depth and breadth of the impacts of natural resources there. So this is, a, this, this is Myanmar, and so it, it has eight divisions and eight, so it's seven divisions and seven states um, administratively divided. Um, so within Myanmar, then I, I go to, this resource goes into the Kachin state, uh, again located up in the north, borders with both China and India. Very rich in natural resources, um, as I indicated earlier. And this is an iconic picture. This is Irrawaddy, uh, mighty Irrawaddy River. And these are the Maika and Malika River that makes Irrawaddy River. And this is where the, uh, one, of the worst, uh, worst, one of the most controversial museo dam is being built. And there are Chinese companies working up here. I was there. I went to visit it um, in 2014 and 15. And then with that, another component to um, acknowledge here is uh, this Kachin state is engulfed in the armed conflict since 1962, when the Kachin leaders thought that the Burmese government um, by then, about by then already. The, the military regime was started uh, um, it's, uh, ruling the country, then they started a rebellion against the Burmese government demanding a Kachin independent state. The rebels are called Kachin Independent Organization, and it's arm wing called Kachin Independent Army, which I have referred K-I-O-N-A. So as I said earlier, this is very rich. This state is rich in natural resources, famous for jade, timber, gold, amber, and hydro. And within that, of course, based on my resource question and its, its objectives, it was impossible to look at the entire aspect of natural resources. So I, 
I narrow it down to community forest. Uh, community forest, as Krogman and Bakley provide an argument, uh, def definition that, hi Gina, uh, that they, community forest is a resource management in which local community manage and also enjoy their economic benefit, as opposed, to, as opposed to community forestry, which is a partnership between the government and the community. So within community forest, I have looked at three specific community forests, Nobu, Tangma, and Washang, which is um, one, of, one of them is here, and two of them is here. And the reason I took three different um, community forests is it has different socio-political dimensions, and I wanted to see what kind of peace building or not can be observed um, through this lens. Okay, now let's go back to resource methods. One of the funny, one of the fun, uh, fun part of my, my work. Um, as you can see in the picture, this was, uh, I, 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 I hiked with these two gentlemen for six hours to see their community forest. And I had just flip flop, is that? And because I wasn't expecting it and I was, I was used to hiking in those middle of forests, but that day I also had this traditional lunji, <laughs> and that made me a bit uncomfortable about what I did. And we walked almost six hours and we went on the top, and this is their sign that this is our community forest uh, border. So this gentleman um, kindly showed me. As I'm presenting, I am definitely reflecting a lot on the individuals who have been central to my re research. So the data collection was carried out 2014 to 17, in its mostly qualitative approach. Um, interviews, mostly in-depth and semi-structural interviews. Uh, semi-structural interviews was carried out in order to deepen the data that was collected through in-depth interviews, and also cross-check some of the data that I collected, and participant observation. This included both formal and informal events like press briefings, policy launch events, uh, Sunday services, uh, some weddings, and so on and so forth. And I, I also collected data through secondary resources, which is um, obviously academic publications, books and journals, articles, policy, press briefings, laws, op-eds, and newspaper reportings. Okay, so here's the, here's the heart of the resource that, uh, this resource that intends to delve deep into and probably problematizes a bit. So, as I indicated earlier, local is completely, uh, uh, deeply complex and contentious. And it, there are lots of definitions about local, but it's hard to comprehend. Uh, scholars like Richmond and McGinty are the leading scholars who talk about local. And they're emerging um, scholars too who are now engaging in, in understanding and defining local. So in order to do that, in order to, in order to add more voice, I have come up with this three uh, key uh, aspects of the local. So what my research says is contestations and negotiations among local actors are central to peace building. Number two, local actors define not just what the local is, but also contest and negotiate who legitimate actors are in relation to community forest. To those who are familiar with peace building literature, we can reflect back to Pooh, uh, Cooper and Turner's argument about who's peace and what kind of peace we're building and who is investing on, on, on that peace. So the idea of legitimacy, the issue of legitimacy is, is central in, in peace building literature. And finally, this I, I appreciate both uh, Professor Lyons and John, uh, Professor Dale, including my chair, that they pushed me a lot to think, go through. And what I, what I come to terms with is that local goes beyond particular territory and idea and does not only exist in the economic context. It's just not, local does not simply exist because there's a global. Local does not exist in its isolation. And as Professor Dale and um, Professor Lyons in their books argue that it is, there are formal and informal networks and institution ideas and notions through which they kind of link. So therefore it, is, it doesn't exist in an isolation. No, nor because of its economic context. So it is indeed an idea, space, actors. That's why I come to with this mind map. Um, and so I have, looked, I have sim simplified as a dynamics of local and peace building 
Um, I can probably confess at this moment, it is not as simple as it looks like, but at least, but at least we can look at this for this purpose of this dissertation. So I have different, I have kind of disaggregated local into actors idea area and space. Thank you to uh, Professor Dale that he pointed out me a lot. So what does that mean? It means, let's imagine this as, as a local and the actors within this area nine space and idea, their contestation negotiation takes place dynamically. And these negotiations and contestations are kind of source of what kind of peace building might yield. And so this is, uh, this is how I was trying to conceptualize in this particular context. So with this kind of conceptualization, what is local in the Kachin state then? My research finds that local constitute geographical territory, that means both in, as Kachin state and as Myanmar as a uh, state, and the government of Myanmar and its interests. The rebel communities living in the Kachin state, their demands, interests, history, culture, knowledge, formal and informal institutions. And within that, then what are, who are the local actors? Includes the government of Myanmar, Tatmadaw. Tatmadaw is a Burmese word, which, is, which means armed, um, uh, the army basically, but the armed forces. The reason I have put this as a influential actor is uh, those of who have witnessing or resourcing, or at least Professor Dale has a deeper understanding that Tatmadaw remains one of the most influential institutions um, in the country. The 2008 constitution still gives them a lot of power, meaning they control three powerful ministries, defense, interior, and border affairs, including NSD, the National Defense um, Council, NDS, NDC. Um, and this is the parliament. Uh, they, in the parliament, they have 25% is allocated for the active military forces. So this is how they participate in parliamentary debates. And so there is an inference actor. And community forest users group, I have called CFOGs, villagers, different ethnic and religious groups, the rebels, Kachin Independent Organization and Army, Community-Based Organization, NGOs, and Activists. All right. Since I talked a lot about community forests, we, I think we should go back a little bit to discuss about the historical genesis of community forests. And why is it important in this particular context? It was, it was interesting to me because a centrally governed country introduces this rather interesting policy, giving rights communities to manage forest, which was the regime itself was involved in illegal logging. And obviously, there are lots of um, data resources that suggest they are involved in illegal logging and so on and so forth. But then they introduced, the, the military government introduced this policy. And that makes quite interesting. And indeed, the communities were puzzled as they, <laughs> and many of them thought, what, this is, agenda, yeah, yeah this, this, this doesn't seem right. But then another, interesting um, incident that I, I see is it coincides with the global environment movement. And if we look back in 1972 was the first global environment conference held in Stockholm, leading to 1990s then became the height of global environment and continues to be going strong. And that particular introduction is somehow coincides with this movement. Um, and the junta apparently was also looking for a space to be part of a global community. While it is its own decision and on doing that, we want to be insular and not want to be a part of international community. But at the same time, there, there are indications that in which they want it to be part of global community through other ways. And so that was part of like introducing this policy is to say that, look, we are with you. We want to also preserve natural resource uh, uh, environment. And then, of course, the interesting issue to recognize here also, while the government introduced policies related to community forest instruction, after it introduced 1993 forest law, then it introduced community forest instruction policy in 1995, yet it remains very lackadaisical in terms of implementing in, in action. So the villagers, puzzled villagers then see the moment an opportunity to establish community forest because especially in the Kachin state, in where um, ethnic Kachins feel that natural resources theirs. We own natural resources. We, we have been dispossessed. We, 
our natural resource has been taken away by Tatmadaw, as they, as they say. And so for them, it is a way to retain their ownership of natural resources. And so the, therefore, there comes the establishment of community forest and its dynamics. Now let's go to the next um, slide then. What, what did it do? My resource findings suggest that community forest actually led to an unlikely peace. And I said, what is unlikely peace then? As I already indicated, the complexity of actors are immense. But under this particular issue, there are engagement between local actors, government, uh, no, and uh, state and non-state actors. So what is unlikely peace and how has it been? How has it been built? So the unlikely peace in the sense that in, in, in a rather very complex and delicate political condition, the establishment community forest has brought these unlikely actors together. And so what I said is once obstinate foes engage in dialogue instead of continuing opposing or resisting. Instead of keep separating, they are kind of coming to interact, particularly the forest department, which is um, responsible to oversee community forest. And so the villagers who basically was always sustaining their own lives without the contact to the government because government for them was almost a very scary thing to think about being. Um, um, to, to go to government office, offices for them is, something happens to me? What am I going to do? <laughs> so, so this engagement, um, there's a one quotation I, I wanted to share with you. It's by a member. She said, I thought that the government would only know how to take away from the people. But it also knows how to give back to people. So it's the sense of like, oh, OK, so the government is giving us back. This is wonderful. So this is, this, this, for many of us, it may sound very simple and naive, or, or very simple. But in the Katina context, it's very revealing. What is this dramatic picture? So is that. <laughs> Sorry, Professor, it must, it must be like. I, I, I woke this morning, I, I thought this is how I can explain. <laughs> so as you can see... It looks so anthropological. Exactly. So, so this is how the politics is organized in, 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 in Myanmar. Not this is the only one, but this is one of the ways they organize the politics. And so look at the Burmese outfit and then the Kachin outfit and the Mon and Shan and Karen. And there are obviously other ethnic groups I have not um, included here. Politics and social relationships are often defined and organized and pursued in this line of ethnic groups, ethnicity. The reason is obviously simple, as if, if we look at the historical context and as well as contemporary context. As I said earlier, Katsina State was never been essentially peaceful. Prior to the British colony, um, in the 18, 1880s, that's the when the British colony annexed Kachin state as part of what we, know, what, what we now know as a modern Burma state. And so Kachin are always suspicious to, to Tatmada, or as they call Bamas. And so politics, social relationships are often defined in these boundaries. But the community forest management has allowed them to interact together, which I will discuss more later. And the interesting part is also the international actors maintain their strategic engagement instead of being as act exports. I'm only talking in the Katina context. So many INGOs that are involved in Katina state are very strategic and cautious about their involvement. Because they know in order for them to continue their work in the Katsin state, they need to be mindful of what's happening in both historical and contemporary context. Contemporary context is probably relevant to discuss here. Um, still, the influential Katsin ethnic leaders are very influential in terms of what kind of development project should come in the Katsin state. Local partnership, so-called partnership, is, cannot uh, take place unless if the international actors take confidence, powerful institutions like in the Kachin State, there are Kachin Baptist Convention, Meta and Salom Foundations, 
and KNDZ, Kachin Networking Development Group, uh, Kachin Conservation uh, Working Group, those are kind of pops up as a major players in the Kachin state. So they, they know that if they do not work with them, their involvement is impossible. So therefore, I call this as a bit strategic engagement. So a bit further deeper than local and likely peace in these three community forests. This resource looks at through ownership perspective. As I indicated earlier, ownership is central to peace building debate. Who owns peace? What kind of ownership? And so here I was trying to look at this dynamics on, uh, in terms of community forest engagement management through ownership and I identified three components of its legal, economic, and social. Legal in the sense that, um, I will show you um, in a bit. So these three community forest users group, for example, the Tangma community forest has nearly 120 members. Nobu has over 130, and Washang has over 260. So in total, all these community forest members have now lent to say that this is, this is part of my land. This, this is, I kind of own this. CFI, Community Forest Instruction, clearly explicit also that they are entitled to pass their community forest plot, which they plant trees, vegetables, um, which they can transfer to their next generation. And there is a clear um, policy guide, guidelines in that sense. So they do feel that this is our land. And there is that sense of like legal entitlement among themselves. And then material and honor, uh, economic ownership. The simple, as we, uh, when I say simple, it is not as simple for the local villagers. Collecting fire, access to firewood, fruits, vegetables, materials for building, house, animal shelter, herbal medicine, including wood processing. If you see, look, look at this picture, I was really surprised to see this. This is in the middle of, for, uh, like really far away in the village. They have established these machines to process uh, the wood when it's ready for harvesting their planted trees. And then this picture is, um, it's rather scary. I was very nervous that day. It was really far away, but it was worth going. And so I met this um, really nice um, gentleman, and he showed me all of these, um, what is called a star fruit. They um, export, uh, export to uh, many Southeast Asian countries. And then these three sacks of um, oral medicine are collected by uh, one of the members of the uh, the herbal? Oh, mm -hmm. herbal. Yes, yes, yes. And which is very, uh, they have a nice market, especially Chinese buyers are all over there. So they kind of make living out of this now. I indicated earlier in terms of the ethnicity religious component, and I'm going to go a little bit deeper here. New forms of engagement. As I said earlier, the rel social relationship was constructed and pursued based on ethnic and religious lines. But this community force has brought them together to have a new form of engagement. If we look at this, sorry, this is a long, but I thought it was worth quoting here. So before the community force was established, Shans and Kachins would not, wouldn't see each other. San would spend their time at home making liquor and working in their farm located in the plains, whereas the Kachins would spend in the mountains collecting wood and food. By the time Kachins come home, Shans would go to sleep. And when Kachins get up and go to the mountain, Shans would have had already started their daily chores. But community forests brought both ethnic groups together to work for a common purpose. And what is staggering here is these ethnic groups actually live side by side. But then it's amazing to get that sense like you didn't talk with your neighbor, especially in a village setting. Sorry, I'm a villager guy. I know each and every household in my village. I know their details, but they they did not. And that was, that was revealing to me. And that's why my experience in village and their experience in, as being villagers is dramatically different. Relearning relationship. So there is obviously because of mistrust and suspicion because of conflict. And Tatma does handling to its public is obviously, I don't have to talk about this, how brutal that was. And, and so then the rebel is there in the Kachin state. 
very strong rebel, uh, believed to be 10,000 strongly trained um, armed forces within with the Kachin Independent Organization. And that kind of very volatile situation, they certainly develop a certain stereotypes about who, who, who are Kachins, who are non-Kachins, and how can we trust them. So there's that mistrust. And under this forest, uh, community forest management, then this is also long, sorry, but I think it's also important to quote here. So before I became part of community forest, I didn't have any familiarity about Lisu people and their culture. So this is, sorry, so, but uh, I learned about them a lot of during settling and plantation as part of the community forest establishment process. We helped each other, talked about our family affairs and share food. Previously, my relationship with Lisu people was superficial. Since the community forest was established, we share knowledge about tree plantation, growing fruits, and discuss our plants. These days, we invite them for our baby naming days and weddings. Again, this context was basically the person who shared this to me, his house is probably 10 feet away from uh, Jingpo, which is one of the sub-ethnic Kachin group. And Lisu is another, um, another, another ethnic group, which is also often considered as a Kachin, but Lisu these days themselves define themselves as a separate than the Kachin, Kachin ethnic groups. So, so 10 feet away, they don't talk. It's, it's amazing to see that. And now they, 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 they shared these incredible stories. And I thought that was very powerful in terms of the uh, connecting or relearning themselves on, on who they feel and how they now understand each other. Now, the important, another important aspect this research finds is international actors rally behind the local nurturing new ways of engagement and helping redefine relationship between state and non-state actors. What the quote I just read out is essentially the international actors kind of rally behind that, as opposed to we are expert, no, 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 don't do that. Why don't you do this way? I rarely saw that in the Kachin state, particularly in terms of community forest management. Then this is a quote by a local NGO uh, official who is as deeply in part of the international uh, community. And so he said, we hired retired officials from the forest department and assigned them to deal with the government office because they know how to work with government office. So when the local, when the NGOs do that, international actors, that's fantastic. You do go ahead and do it. Because like, we don't know, we don't have access to the government. So you, you can do it this way. Go, go, for it. Go, go ahead and do it. As opposed to, no, 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 maybe this is not the right approach. Um, as often the critics uh, point out in terms of how international actors behave. And as, act as a catalyzing force rather than expert again uh, the same way. And maintain strategic engagement considering the fragile political landscape of the Kachin state. As I discussed earlier, they know that they cannot antagonize those local NGOs or CBOs. So they have to work with them together. If they do that, they cannot. OK, I want to, this is a rather intense presentation, I feel. So I want to put a little pause here. So it's all about unlikely peace. Now, not, not every, every picture is rosy here, as Professor Lyons pointed out oftentimes in his comments. And I agree with, with, with that. And so going deeper into the data and its analysis, I have come to the terms that when the social and political condition provides space for the local actors, they are likely to exploit local led peace building, leading to intransigent peace. And I call it intransigent peace because it, this kind of peace often comes as there's a peace. But if you dig deep, the structural condition that were pr probably drivers of conflict kind of remain same. Actors may have shifted, but the source remain, uh, the, 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 the type of violence kind of continues to exist. And so let's take this as an example. Like for example, this is, a, this is a, from Nobu Community Forest. I also hiked all the way up here, and it was wonderful. It was, I had a suit that day. It was like, <laughs> so it was on top of the hill, and there's this, and they are so, the leadership of the Nobu Community Forest is so proud of introducing me about this, and how they got the funding, and how they built, and so on and so forth. But then legally, that is not OK. That, that was there. And I asked the chairman, so how did you build this? And did you talk with the government? So like, he just smiled. <laughs> I might get a letter 
That's what he's different. I, I might get a letter from, <laughs> from Naomi. And then this idea of establishing this in the top of community forest, which is supposedly um, should be collective decision by the members, but members are not really part of this. No, not only just deciding to build this, but also the building process. And then, and therefore, I think it's with this, I'm, I'm going to show you this, um, this uh, graph. Oh, sorry. So if you look at this, this membership, around 130, Jingpo ethnic groups are 103. And then you look at this religious component, 101. And then Shan is just two. That village is basically, majority of them are Shan ethnic groups. There's just two. Mm. And that certainly raises the question, how did you build this then? So there's this clear linkage their idea of establishing dominance of Jingpo ethnic groups um, in this management system. Um, then, <clears throat> then let's go back here, and then there, therefore I said, in Nobu Community Forest, legal and social political conditions provide space for the local actors to pursue hyper-ethno-nationalistic forest management approach, as opposed to this is a collective property. We should be managing collectively. But this is, this is, this is we can control this, we can build this. And this, this type of um, very ethno-nationalistic, hyper-ethno-nationalistic approach. Then with the Tangma Community Forest, <laughs> Um, sorry, I may have to go back to, but um, it also, it is okay, it is compared to normal community forest. So again, Lisu is highest ethnic groups, but then, especially this is remarkable. The Assembly of God and Church of Christ, you, you know, the, the, Myanmar is deeply, deeply religious society. And so this religious um, parts, uh, the, the groups who belong to two different religions are worth noting here. Now, how this Tangma community forest then has a bit of challenges in terms of um, local-related peace building is they suffer access to resources compared to noble community forest. Noble, noble community forest leadership has, because they are Jingpos, Kachin Jingpos, they have access to uh, powerful and very organized NGOs like Kachin Baptist Conventions. Nobu Community Forest, who has access to resources through their entrenched network, the religious network, and their community network. Tangma Community Forest, who are dominated by Lisu, and religiously they are related to Assembly of God and Church of Christ. Assembly of God and Church of Christ is interesting. They also arrived in the country in the early 1930s. Whereas Baptist obviously arrived in 1840, 1830s or so. So their network, Assembly of God, is very dismal compared to Kachin Baptist Convention. So they are not as organized and well-funded. Um, the Assembly of God and Church of Christ are not religiously that um, sophisticated, both in terms of network and also uh, finances compared to Kachin Baptist Convention. So, the, so Tangma Community Forest suffers that kind of social networks to have access to resources. And that's one of the challenges. And in, in all three community forests, gender dimension, particularly female participation, is heartbreaking in many ways. If you look at this picture, women in Myanmar are very active. They, are, they participate in a lot of programs. They are very, very active. And this is organized by the UNDP in the program called Social Cohesion, and I observed them a number of times. And they, were, they participate actively. The engagement is amazing. Yet, the community forest management fails to include the gen, uh, women members. But then, obviously, Wasan Community Forestry has a different story to tell. Um, we may have to go back to the, uh, to the, uh, the graph. So if you look at around 200, 30, nearly 40, Lisu are highest, and this is majority, uh, this village is dominated by majority Lisus. And then, but then Lavaos are 60, these are also uh, Kachin sub-ethnic groups, and Lachiri is also. 
and then religiously baptism. Yet, this membership demography is compared to both Nobu and Tangma is very inspiring in many ways. The reason why Wasang was able to do this have but three reasons. Um, when the establishment, the history of the establishment of these three community forests is interesting. So Nobu Community Forest was established in 2014. And Wasang Community Forest was established in 2007. During the establishment in Wasang Community Forest, the leadership basically discussed the idea of establishing community forest across the village, in visiting each household, to inviting them to, um, we are holding this discussion to establish community forest. Contrary to this approach, Nobu Community Forest only discuss within their church. On the Sunday, uh, they, they call uh, Kitchen Baptist um, Convention, they, have, they hold Sunday service every uh, Sunday service. And they discuss in that in terms of how to um, establish community forest there. And there, therefore, when I talk with Shans who were not part of the community forest, they say, well, I didn't hear about it. Or I'm not really interested to those who have means to um, live their life. But to those who kind of want to be, they were not aware of that. And so this kind of, the, establish, the ways in which the Wasang Community Forest has been established tells a different story from that perspective. And also, it also followed Community Forest Instruction policy in which it encourages, or in fact tells villagers to have an inclusive membership. And then, leadership is important here to mention, although uh, Professor Lyons um, has really interesting um, point to make. But the leadership was impressive in the sense that this is our forest. If we do not manage now, again, the Chinese company will take away. So we'll have to manage this. So there is that kind of like you versus me. If we protect this, we can stand up against the big corporation that Chinese are coming and trying to establish a banana plantation and so on and so forth. All right. So. Finally, these are, whoa, so, 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 so these, these are the key findings that this, uh, this decision makes an argument. First, contestation and negotiation among local actors is central to peace building. Local is not self-organized and harmonious and does not necessarily help build peace. Expanding or creating social and political space for local actors to engage constructively helps locally led peace building work better. Contrary to the critics, International actors' engagement that strategically and con cautiously considers local political landscape remains crucially important in peace building. In addition to economic factors, integrating social political dimensions of natural resources help peace building work better. So thank you very much for your patience and um, listening to my presentation. Thank you so much, Dorendra. That was a really rich and uh, well-organized presentation. And I think the, the photos are sort of especially nice for us to see that because they bring us right into your, your research, which was, I think, such a, a central part of this whole project was that time that you were able to spend. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to turn first to uh, John Dale. To, as an outside committee member to pose a couple questions and make comments. I think it's one. Uh, it's there. Is that good? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start with your central concept uh, of the local. Uh, so on your sixth slide, or the, where your slide on, I guess, our page six, what is uh, local in the Kachin state? The bottom slide. If you might be able to put it up. Sorry, it's the. Oh, there it was. Okay, great. So uh, the, the local actors include uh, the government of Myanmar, uh, the military, the Tatmadaw. Uh, Commun local community organizations, um, the villagers of different ethnic and religious groups, including uh, CBOs 
NGOs and activists, and uh, the KIO and KIA. So that's a lot of, that's a lot of local uh, going on there. And as you've described in, in other slides, um, the different ethnic and religious groups are uh, in, in some ways talking about each other as, as though they're different nationalities. Um, so uh, the one thing that seems to hold them together, as you say, is the community force. And it's a kind of institution that they've been creating uh, over time. You refer to it as a space. It's also a discursive space where they've been able to negotiate and contest each other's practices. But together, uh, it seems to be holding, holding together fairly well in, in these cases, right? Um, why, why is this local, say, as opposed to a, a transnational institution? Um, when you're thinking about this in the broader context of Myanmar, and they discuss national reconciliation across all of these different groups and others, ethnic minority groups, uh, you have a, a, a tough, it's, it's, this is almost kind of a, a microcosm of a, sure. of a broader sure. peace process, sure. right? Sure. The community force. Sure. Um, and each of them have for a long time since independence and before, uh, fought hard to, to defend their own territorial spaces, they have their own militaries, um, to try and bring them all under one umbrella has always been you know, the holy grail. They've been basically in civil war since the beginning of independence. Um, it seems that referring to it, referring to the, the space as just local sort of misses, it kind of, uh, what's the best term, sort of strips the, the nationalist perspectives that are also very much a part of the conflict in that site of, uh, uh, that institutional site that you're looking at of the community force. Now they seem to be negotiating that much better than the government is on a, on a broader scale uh, in the <coughs> national reconciliation process. Uh, the, Ro the Rohingya aren't even, you know, a part of that process right now, obviously. but. I'm wondering why, why bore into the local so much, uh, especially when ultimately you sort of critique the local and you point out it's a very contested site. Uh, why not something like tran translocal or, or transnational? Um, it is, a, you, I mean, Myanmar, the government claims it's a national territory altogether. And they could just come in and lay claim to it at any time. But other ethnic minorities might not be so ready to identify with just one nationality. So already that's a transnational discursive space you're dealing with. But in the community forest, while they all come together, they still do recognize their differences, even though they can work together as one. So is there a reason why you want to hold on to the, sure, the sure. local in particular? Sure. Um, thank you. That is, that is very, very um, critical issue that you raised. And I often grapple with um, how to conceptualize this, that if I, is it okay if I sit down and just um, re respond? Yeah, yeah, um, <laughs> and I think the idea of local, the imagination of local in this particular context is, I, despite the criti criticism, I think local remains very instrumental in peace building aspect. And probably this is, a, this is also, uh, conceptualization process that one has to, or many researchers like me will have to grapple over the days, over the years to come, or if not decades. But what is more interesting here um, to define this as a local, or at least from this, in this context, is that the local actor's engagement makes it, despite, as I said earlier, in terms of conceptualization, it is, it exists not in isolation, it exists in both global and local contexts, and local is kind of interrelated to the global context as well. But then the way they engage in legitimizing their voices, then interaction, makes it grounded in, in their context. Meaning what we are doing here is kind of based, so community forestry is a forest in the Kachin state. And this, we are part of this, we need to protect this, we need to manage this. Ultimately, we are 
kind of uh, communities who will who would be benefited. So that sort of like uh, engagement is the, is the is a thread that I'm holding in, um, and and therefore linked with the, the, the idea of local. So that, so Kachin then is the is the primary. Yes. Yes. Within. So that that that's very interesting. So within the Kachin, uh, within the Kachin, sta uh, Kachin ethnic groups, there is a sense of urgency among themselves that, if you look link with KI, KIO and KIA's demand in 1962 onwards all the way to 1980s and all the way to 1940 when they, they had ceasefire, then they have changed their position. They no longer demand independent Kachin state. They rather want to be a part of uh, Burma uh, federal state. And so that's kind of like changing over the course of their thinking and demand is also evolving. And so they also know that they can, while there is that um, ethnic chauvinism there, but they also understand that we need to have a broader kind of approach with other um, non-ethnic -eth Kachins to retain our rights. So there is that kind of sense of urgency among themselves. So, so one of the actors that's also local, though, is, is uh, the government of Myanmar. It's interesting, you say. So uh, there, it, it would, I would suspect, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, that there, oh, sorry. I <coughs> the, government, the government of Myanmar is also one of these local actors you identify. And I would suspect that they have a, a different understanding or discourse on the local than uh, any of the other Kachin groups, or and possibly even you'd find multiple different discourses around what constitutes the local there. Um, could you describe the differences in what in what they might call local? So, especially with the government, I'm kind of curious as to how they um, claim, uh, lay claim to the community. Sure, sure. The I have to be here very clear that my data collection in terms of government perspective is only based on laws and policies. I went to meet uh, officials who uh, they have, again, like military outfit, the forest department. You, you feel like before entering there, should I talk with this guy or not? He already is kind of very intimidating in terms of his posturing and um, his stars here is well-dressed. And, and so here, Talking with them and also the laws and policy over the course of since, particularly since 2011 on wars after the general election and so on and so forth, that the government is towards protecting forest. It is time to change the course of action. That may be, that may not necessarily reflect Tatmadaw's thinking, but Lick's government's thinking is that in that line. And so providing laws and policy as a way to engage community members is, I think, state is thinking as positive steps towards um, environmental conservation. So if you look at the, the, uh, the changes since uh, the elections in, early even since 2010, uh, the changes in land laws across most of the right. countries that have allowed uh, mining companies to, to come in and mining companies come in and strip uh, long-held user rights sure, sure. Of, of farmers and, and other uh, more simpler miners, I guess, uh, yeah. from the land. Uh, do you think that, is it your sense that the government sees these community forests, these, these resources and this kind of institution that they've created uh, as an exception in some way that where they would create a kind of uh, a special ex legal exception uh, for these collective rights to use the community forests in a way that um, their other land laws certainly have not. Sure, sure. And, and why? <laughs> it seems like a success story if that's, if that's true. But that's a that, that's a, that's very uh, good point. And I think especially after the 2011 onwards, uh, because of the political situation rapidly changing, in some aspect, but in other aspect remains unchanged from Tatmadaw's perspective, right? But then, um, 
as one of the um, NGO workers told me that since Aung San Suu Kyi came into power, that we have been able to see first department officials who are much more friendly to us. We can work together. They can understand. They are willing to listen to us, as opposed to um, previously it was not the case. So I think there is that. And um, it probably is a bit tricky to say that this is an exception. However, it is an exception in the sense that while uh, those land which are now since 2014 land law update, um, government is massively promoting agribusiness in, mm. in an industrial level. And some of the community forests, particularly um, Washang and Nobu, these are the forests up in the hills. They can't plant bananas up there. Or um, at least that's one aspect. That land is important for the local communities. And the government wants them to protect it. And the engaging community members to protect the forest is a way to go. That's, I think, sense that the state uh, feels. Um, and then the increasing protest by the local um, communities is increasing. And so it, the state is also mindful of that. So having this community force as a uh, way to engage uh, the villagers is probably, it thinks, as a positive step and, and probably continue to, continues to do so until, the, of course, the state is powerful. So. Thanks, Sharon. Sure, John's. Uh, congratulations again. Uh, one kind of larger point relating to the other uh, doctoral students who are watching. One of the things that was very so impressive to me is the course of your dissertation development is how you went from a solid first draft to responding to comments to write a really excellent final draft or whatever we're at, whatever the, the, the defense draft and uh, you are to be commended for that and that we built in enough time for you to do that. I think this, this draft that you have now is really improved in many ways in important ways than the first draft and so that's an important part of the dissertation process and that's mostly for the rest of you. You already know this. Um, the other thing that I really like about this, uh, and then I'll ask you a mean question, um, <laughs> but is that I was, th this sort of, what, what I would call sort of the first generation of the turn of the local, had a tendency to romanticize the local. The local was where peace building lived and where villages knew their interest and knew what to do. And it was also very, very vague. Now, I have a little concern of, of, of John's concern that you do list the local has now become everything. So rather than being too vague, it's now too broad. I pushed you to say more on the transnational, so I'm partly responsible for that. But what I really like about what you've done with the local is how you, you, you center it around contestation and negotiations. The local is the site of the conflict. It's not, uh, it's not, not uh, you know, sealed away from the conflict or outside of the conflict. So in that way, I think this dissertation makes a real contribution to problematizing, critiquing the critique uh, that was the, uh, the turn to the local. Now let me make that li link that in some ways, but to uh, uh, a, a, a more a different point. Now, as you know, the, the, the literature on this coming out of the liberal the critique of the liberal peace building was really mostly on post-conflict peace building when the war was over. How did you liberal peace building when there were insurgents and there was a government and maybe the UN was there and they were doing post-conflict elections and all the rest of that? That's not your case, uh, uh, which is fine. Maybe one of the other contributions is to point out how the local can help us explain a pre-peace process and what is peace and what is not peace is very complicated in a place like Myanmar. But, but then finally, here comes my question, yeah, you knew it was coming, is the, the, the <laughs> role of the, of the KLO uh, uh, and army, the Gachin uh, uh, political organization and army, which plays a very, very minor role in your narrative of these community forests which, to my thinking, as somebody who's interested in civil wars, how can that be? Do they support the community force? Are they happy that the community force are a mechanism to keep the Chinese out or the government out? Or alternatively, another read from a distance, not knowing the, the case, is that it sounds like a classic uh, winning hearts and minds counterinsurgency <laughs> technique. Not surprising that that's what governments in war zones do, is they try to do something to keep, get the villagers on your side. You know, strategic hamlets was the way we called it sure. when the US was in Vietnam. Vietnam. So how do you relate the war 
to the peace building process sure. that you're trying to explain? Um, th uh, well, first of all, thank you for your generous comment um, earlier. And with regard to that crucial question that you pointed out, um, I went back to read some uh, counter incidency literature mm. after your comments. And uh, Kilkirk, yeah, he's, he's one of the, seems like authority in, in terms of um, counter incidency rating. Um, it is indeed looks like when you look at it, the community forestry, from counter incidency perspective, it just seems that way. But what is also interesting here is KIO and A's involvement here is very implicit. Like implicit. implicit. Mm -hmm. They support it, in other words. They support it because ultimately community forestry is managed and organized by the community members, which are part of the Kachin ethnic groups. Mm -hmm. So they see that. And with that, are they trying to strengthen their base support? Generally, that question emerges, right? While that is, that could be the same, uh, that could be the case, at the same time, as I said, the rebels in, uh, continue to um, uh, continue their armed struggle is, has become far more complex than what was in early 2011. So because complex now, complex now eight right? Years ago? Mm -hmm. Right, because the Chinese involvement. Mm. The Chinese are essentially um, holding the peace talks mm. in their territory. Interesting. And so the KIO has become almost in between the Chinese involvement in Burma and Burmese government. So they are, so the, the conflict has become completely, uh, probably out of, out of getting control from the Burmese government. Can, can I ask you sure, sure. just to probe on that point? And so is it the fact that both the Burmese government and the KIO both simultaneously support the community forests? Yes. Because both see these forests as advancing their contradictory interests of keeping the Chinese out, perhaps. They have a super, you know, they, they both agree on that. We can disagree about who should control sure. this land, but we both agree we don't want the Chinese in. I, th I think that's, th that's th there's a good point on that. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I do mm -hmm. agree. I do agree. There is that uh, concerted effort that, uh, because a lot of fertile land where they can plant bananas and um, watermelons and so on and so forth. So you could see, I have a bunch of pictures. You can see the uh, acres of land is now banana plantation. And I actually lost myself there one day. Because it's really big and, but at the same time, very toxic. They use extreme chemi chemicals to uh, grow bananas and also. Um, so, so from that perspective, there is that, I think there's a way that community can engage, the interaction between the state and community uh, villagers are increasing to push back the international interest. I Good. Thank you. Thank you. I, I do have one more. Do you want me to ask it now, or do you want to take on a round? Go I'll go for it now. It goes back to your uh, charts with all the different uh, makeups sure. of those community sure. forest uh, sure. organizations. You can put well, up any. You're taking my is this your question? <laughs> because your, your question, at one point, you have quotes about how I didn't know my, no, one more where you have the different, oh. uh, this one had so many people and that one had so oh. many uh, Baptists so and all the rest yeah. of that. You're three of them, one for each of your community sure, sure, forests. Sure, sure. There you go. That one will work just fine, although it's, uh, anyways, you have, you, you make a lot about how these community forests have allowed for a kind of breaking of boundaries and people who in the village who didn't even know each other are now working together in the community forest. But when I read these three uh, charts, they're mostly mono-ethnic, or sure. at least they're mono-sub-ethnic of the Kachin, if I understand these categories correctly. This is a Lusu organization, right? And another one is... Uh, the other, the other two are sure. all Jingpao. Yeah. Um, and so how is it that these organizations that are so, by your definition, culturally co uh, monocultural uh, become the site where inter-ethnic, inter-religious uh, cooperation can, can emerge? Did I take your question? Yeah, that's ah. okay. <laughs> it's, good. it's a good question. <laughs> it's, it's Thank you. So as, as the quote said, it, while it seems like mono-ethnic domination, in the Kachin context, if, if we, when we link with both historical and contemporary context, this is really impressive um, in the, from that perspective. 
like this I think is the most diverse of your three actually uh, the other one is more diverse yeah. the, the Washang is more diverse is than okay, I don't um, this is much more diverse this is the success so so okay. the, okay. so the D so in, in except they're all Baptist the, religiously they are all Baptist but in, in terms of when you look at the village demography this is this is this is I think in this uh, in a contemporary political context this is probably the best they could do mm. and, and and therefore it is the reason I said it is still revealing is the neighbors who didn't really speak the neighbors who kind of sus suspected each other were they, is he a spy of the KIO or is he a spy of the Tamada or a spy of something else um, is he here to uh, cons conspire something else so th in that context this kind of membership is very impressive it's not I'm not saying that that's what they told me <laughs> so themselves. right they themselves told me so I'm, I'm not making they at least perceive it as interesting exactly exactly and exactly they operate within it as exactly exactly mm -hmm. and so good I'll let you ask the next one <laughs> thank you thank you so much both of you very 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 important questions so um, Durandra just to go back to, to your beginning today. Thank you so much for your kind uh, comments. Um, I told you I was just gonna kind of jump right in and not say much about the journey that I feel you've been on and that, that we've been on, because I thought that might set the emotional tone a little bit. Um, but you, you have made me think a lot about journeys. Um, and you write in, uh, I hope people will get an opportunity to read Durandra's dissertation because you write about your own personal journey and I'm really glad that you included that because I think it helps us to see the, the um, depth of the research that you were able to, to do, the level of engagement that you were able to achieve in the field and it helps us to, I think also to, in some ways to understand why local remains so important uh, for you, to really trying to figure out what goes on in, in village dynamics, given that your journey, that's where your journey, personal journey, um, started. So it's a, that's a comment on the range of, of the kind of the style of your dissertation and the range of things that you were able to include, your own voice, as well as the voice of others. And I'll get back to that, voice of, of people on the ground. Just a comment on the discussion that John led us off on in terms of putting so much onto, um, onto the local. And I, and I think there's something to this notion of, of the breadth. And, and that might be something to think about you know, on, as you finish things, um, finish things up. Although I understand why you want all of those dynamics at play as you think about how this space is contested and negotiated. I'm thinking about what kind of analytic constructs do we come out with from your dissertation? So picking it up away from Myanmar, per se, where I agree the state, maybe we need to distinguish the kind of role that that particular state has played. Um, but what, what would you advise as we think about the peace building literature more broadly and the role that an analytic construct of local will play. Okay, we're beyond local global because you've said to us we've got to really be talking about these dynamics. Where, what would you counsel in terms of what, what should people do with the state? <laughs> what should people do with transnational um, um, actors? And I'm not going to ask you to answer that right now. It's a little bit more of a comment because I think it builds on uh, something, on, on things that have been said before. And I mean, you're, you're free to, to answer that. But I, I, I think think about it for the long term, maybe even turning your back a little bit on Myanmar and saying, okay, I've had a lot to say here about local. And what do, what do I want to offer people analytically that they might be able to use elsewhere? And are they going to be afraid that the state gets a little too folded fold it in. Uh, so, you, so that question's on the table. You're welcome to, to speak to it. But I wanted just to um, go back just for a second to uh, the question that, that Terrence was raising. And, and maybe, again, in the spirit of journeys, can you talk a little bit about how you came 
to understand what these differences meant. In other words, uh, you were interested in which communities sort of work to build peace in some ways and which seem to not be reaching the, 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 the levels, uh, at least if we take this as the success, take Weshong as the success case. So how did you come to understand that this was about cross-ethnicity and how did you come to understand what role religion played? Because I think that you've got mul kind of multiple explanations happening. And I'm wondering how set you, you feel now um, in terms of the, the, the role that, like an ideology of inclusivity, right? You know, was that a driving force? Or how much did religious ideology shape the agentive choices. And I really wanted to come back and bring it down to an agentive level because whatever the political and military structures are, in the end, it was people who came together and made something of those, of those structures. And in, in that sense, you know, again, it takes us back to a certain notion of local. So, so could you just talk a little about how you came to understand what role the desire, maybe some desire for, for inclusivity or the role of religious ideology played? That's a very, very difficult question to answer. <laughs> I'll try. Um, the society, as, as I um, discussed during my presentation, so the, the Kachin society is basically built around the ethnic lines and religious lines. With that kind of thinking, there's also, as I was responding to, uh, I think, Professor Lyons' answer, uh, question, and also your, uh, Professor Dale's, there is that this suspicion, mistrust that has been existed because of the historical context and also the contemporary context that there's a desire to come together, uh, particularly, I think, since it's ironically after 2011, because of the opening of, uh, of opening of the country, the multinational companies walked in. And so before, the Kachin ethnic groups would live in, a, they, they would, would just wander around the forest, they, they collect vegetables, firewoods, and so on and so forth. Now, after this opening, a lot of multinational companies came to possess the land, to start agribusiness in the, the industrial level. And that kind of created a fear among themselves. Oh, we're losing everything now. Now, before the Burmese government, that mother took away, now the multinational foreign company is coming and we are losing our so resources now. So there's that sense of, there are a lot of quotes that I have in which the community members have talked about. Um, in fact, one of the handouts, there is a, um, I don't have, there's in, in, the, in, the behind, in the back of the page, um, so there's like, community forest is like seeing logs that are floating in the river, but inside the river there are more precious and important elements. So that sense of, um, that sense of losing everything, and we need to come to protect control these resources is important. So there's a, that desire that, that a kind of appeared over the course of, um, particularly after 2014 onwards. Because when you look at the FDI and also the multinational companies investing in Myanmar, especially thousands and thousands of acres are taken away without even notifying the villagers who, who thought that was their land, but then it turns out that's not theirs because they can't produce uh, legal documents that the government requires. And so without knowing, they have become landless. And there are lots of um, instances. Uh, I think in 2015, uh, after, after the election, Aung San Suu Kyi-led uh, government uh, formed a committee under the vice president's um, chairman, Sip, to look, uh, to uh, investigate 
how much land has been dispossessed and and is the way that the government can give uh, give the land back to the communities so the thousands of examples that the state is trying to do that as well and so among the villagers there is that urgency that we are losing everything now Be before Tatmadaw was our enemy now Tatmadaw remains our enemy multinational companies are coming and we are losing everything so there is that desire of like being part of this process Can I ask a, a follow up I'm not sure they're in the bigger picture as you're moving forward in your oops in the bigger picture as you're moving forward in your research um, yeah, I keep wanting, you, you've got us focused on uh, Kachin State. Do you happen to know, or have you seen any reports on how many community forests they estimate exist with, within Myanmar, uh, for one? Cause, and, and as you're thinking about that, if, as you're proposing the possibility of the state maybe <coughs> reclaiming more land or giving back more, it seems like you'd be well situated to right on top of that process and, and have you know a basis a case study for more comparative work throughout sure. Myanmar sure that's a very good question and and so when I went to Kachin State in 2014 they had nine community forests in the entire Kachin State and then in 2017 there were 60 of them I went then I wanted to get a national data on that and it I just didn't get it I th they didn't give me uh, and the NGOs uh, the governments would have data and to to get a data from government is uh, still remains very difficult so in a national scale I would imagine at least around 500 by now but um, in the Katin state also from 2014 to 17 from 9 to all the way 60 and that was very uh, impressive. It's on the rise. On the rise. It's, it's, it's yeah. across, the, across the state. So yes. Really yes. That, that's sort of what was making me wonder if it might be part of a, a strategy as, as part of a broader national reconciliation process. And these could be one element of that, right? these, I, creating these institutions. Yeah, Professor Dale, I think that could be another big uh, resource that one can, or probably I might be interested to look at that, or anybody who is doing research in Myanmar. That's a really interesting aspect. I think we'll open up for some questions from, uh, from the audience. We'll maybe have 10 to 15 minutes of questions. Or shorter. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, um, congratulations on this wonderful research, and I really learned a lot. Um, I, I would like to ask something a little bit follow up on um, Professor Dale's question. What's the role of the Myanmar state in this? Because it's, uh, as if I understand it correctly, this community forest was created or initiated by the state um, top down so that um, the local communities could have um, ownership in these forests so that they can protect and also keep the Chinese away. Um, so, but from what from your presentation, I, I get that um, yeah, just you, you focus on the contestation of the local, but I would just keep wondering what uh, what role does the state uh, play in this process, especially how is the how are the memberships uh, allocated? Like you talk about diverse di membership, how are how is interest uh, distributed in this process? Uh, who would have have the, the authority if any conflicts arise? And again, where's the, where's the state in, in this process? Thank okay. you. Thank you, thank you. Can we maybe take one more question? Anybody, Scott? I'm the microphone here, so. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, I really enjoyed the presentation. Um, and I'll kind of, in a way, maybe provide a question that is on the opposite end of the spectrum in terms of international uh, and taking up this this thought about national reconciliation processes. So, in, what uh, do you see in terms of processes being modeled uh, in the forest management that uh, are allowing for some of these elements uh, to of peace building to to take place in a way? Uh, 
and do you think that those could be done in other places? In a way, you've described a situation in which there's sort of like minimum enabling constraints on the space, and that may be a part of, you know, part of me wondered if, uh, if that happened because the government was not looking in a way, or, you know, just sort of like, Matt, it would be nice if you managed this, or it'd be nice if it was available for us to do something with it later that we want. And then these communities, due to these other pressures, moved into the space more swiftly and kind of, in some ways, occupied that land and developed processes out of a necessity, right? So there's then a, an opportunity to kind of, through your role, uh, you know, with, you know, transnational relationships and, and having done this research, to potentially lift up that work they've done to legitimize it in other areas because we're at a different part of the process where especially if they're increasing probably people are paying more attention and part of the magic of, uh, of what has taken place in a way has been in the in, in the in the looseness it seems like of of around uh, what's limiting the local actors right and and you know at the same time if you create a some kind of a mix of, of key things that took place, we could imagine also others might try to then impose that in other spaces. So there's a bit of that double-edged sword, right? Uh, but, but what can we learn from those processes? What were the concrete processes? And could they be used uh, in other forest management spaces as a key component of, uh, of national peace building slash reconciliation? Sure, thank you. Um, with your, um, with regard to your question, I think one of the contestation in peace building literature is that who advocate the scholars who advocate for locally led peace building is that they often overlook the state's role, and then state is a fundamental actor, and we cannot deny that. And so that's, I think that's, is we need to imagine um, when we think about locally led peace building from that perspective. Um, and while the state enacted the community forest instruction policy, laying a legal uh, base for community members to establish a community forest, the state didn't actually implement a new practice. It simply enacted the community members and activists seized that opportunity to, uh, to establish forests because they thought this is a good way to have ownership of their natural resources. And your question is um, complicated, uh, difficult, <laughs> uh, sensitive. Um, I, I, I probably have to be um, cautious about what I say, yes. but um, these uh, the KIO and A uh, and the ULFAS cross-bordering are, I think, we all know. And the Indian government's involvement, we all know. So I, 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 I don't want to go beyond that. Um, and Professor Romano's um, question is, um, there is what can we, the, the processes that enable them to be part of this community forestry is, I think, important and probably um, can be, no, I'm not gonna say it's not replicated, but the, the, the ways in which the community members have participated can be imagined in other places as well. Um, what ways uh, is, as, um, as I was responding to uh, Professor Horace's question, that the, the desire to be part of this process was important for them. And the legal provisions that allowed them to, who were disposed, who were basically deemed as landless, now have the opportunity to be part of this uh, establishing community forest. And that allowed them to imagine themselves as what they thought was the, the ultimate owner of the resources allowed them to really um, delve into and seize that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so the sense of participation, I think, in that sense is extremely important. Um, 
I think that's where the question of ownership comes a lot, in, in particularly in peace building uh, literature. So who owns the peace and how you uh, reconcile from peace building perspective um, in a, as divisive as a country like Myanmar. So the idea of being part and both legally and otherwise was basically for them a way to be part of this stab uh, establishing community forest. Um, maybe the committee will step out for a few minutes, so you're welcome to continue having the conversation. You can take a breath. Thank you. <laughs> if you would like, and let's Congratulations. Thank you. Nice job. Thank you. So we'll be back.